Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first phone community call. Thank you all for attending, and we're happy to have you all here with us. Uh, looking forward to this, and we'll have more of these in the future. And since this is the first one, we'll use this as kind of a basis for future calls. Yeah, um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we're just going to do a quick uh, introduction of who's here from the foam team and would love if everyone could just chime in with a quick intro. Uh, so I'm Ryan, uh, CEO and one of the co-founders of Foam. So thanks all for joining and submitting your questions. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. I'm also sitting here with Christopher. Hi, uh, Christopher, the CTO and co-founder. Also here to answer questions. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Katya Zavialova. I'm a chief creative officer and also co-founder. Hey, everyone. Hi, I'm Arthur. I'm the marketing director. Um, great to be here. Hi, I'll chime in. Uh, hi, I'm Melissa Wright. Um, I help to support um, the work around partnerships and business development um, and very much involved uh, with the open source uh, geospatial community, uh, including uh, OpenStreetMap. I think that's it, huh? <clears throat> sure. Um, it might be kind of hard to organize, but if anyone on the call wants to chime in and just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Gavin. Um, I'm in Canada. I'm interested in uh, providing a couple of zone anchors. Awesome, thanks. I'm Connor. Uh, I work at Consensus, building an asset tracking tool and in, interested in integrating proof of location in the future. Hi, I'm Rick. Uh, I'm an advisor uh, uh, for Foam Space. Cool. Thanks for joining, Rick. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, hello, my name is, uh, is Michael Case. And, um, uh, I've worked on the localization uh, about 15 years ago on the um, data fusion and stuff like this. And I was um, very interesting with uh, the fusion between uh, lo precise localization and uh, blockchain and, and so on. Great to have you. Thanks. Uh, anyone else want to just chime in with an intro? If not, we can move on uh, with the agenda and questions. Um, okay, so we can just move on with the agenda we posted and get to the conversation and questions. Um, so first, just like a short overview for any newcomers. Uh, I'm sure if you're on this call, you might be a bit familiar with Foam already, uh, but just so you know, we're building spatial protocols and uh, location standing for blockchain technology. Uh, we kind of have three major elements to the project that all uh, work together but also independently. Uh, this is the crypto spatial coordinate, which is a location encoding standard uh, that any smart contract could inherit uh, and join a registry. Uh, we have a spatial index, which is a full stack uh, web app visualizer, so a visual blockchain explorer that can uh, basically index these crypto coordinates and be used for any application. Uh, and then the way to really tie this all together and figure out if where these contracts claim they are if they are actually there as the proof of location aspect, uh, which would involve time synchronization uh, radios and what we call zone anchors. Um, so we're making a lot of progress on uh, those aspects of the project and we may have tried our um, beta. And um, we've also just launched the developer portal uh, with API and sample applications and tutorials uh, for people to start to build these spatial applications. I don't know if Christopher, you wanted to say a word about this portal. Uh, well, so I'm not sure if it's gone out on the blog uh, yet, but we have effectively opened up the API that powers the spatial index for um, public access. 
uh, you still require a authentication token that you generate by accessing the spatial index. But we're essentially looking to uh, roll out more and more features of the API on that page. So uh, yeah, check it out. And if you have any questions uh, of that, I'd be really happy to answer them today. Um, yeah, and for those of you that have had a chance to try the Spatial Index beta, which if you haven't, uh, it's beta.phone.space. We recently pushed an update uh, that allows you to sign transactions uh, with a uport as opposed to MetaMask. Uh, so you can test your self-sovereign identity and test deploying these crypto spatial coordinate contracts. Um, uh, we had a good time working with the uport team. I don't know if any earlier, Martin or Christopher, want to say anything about that integration, if not. We can take that, um, maybe if it comes up as a question. Sure. Uh, and just kind of uh, more recent developments, we've been uh, getting more recognition for this proposed crypto spatial coordinate standard. I had recently been invited to speak at the Open Geospatial Consortium uh, Technical Committee, which helps with a lot of global standards. Uh, Arthur, uh, who's on the call, is able to attend. Uh, so maybe you can just put an update about that. Um, yeah, we're um, running as an associate member now. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be part of forming a working group on uh, geospatial geospatial standards for the blockchain, and uh, we're hoping that the geospatial coordinate standard, which is our proposed standard for location specific smart contracts, will be adopted um, industry wide through the support of the Open Geospatial Consortium. So we're working on that, and it's yeah, it, they're very interesting. Cool. And I know a lot of the update are there. A lot of people have questions about how um, zone anchors work, and it is appears in a lot of the questions we'll get to soon. But um, Katya, our chief creative officer, has been working on kind of a visual animation to help uh, work as an explainer. I know that's on the agenda. If you want to try to speak to that, Katya. Well, I mean, it's not that uh, that much. Um, we were we've been working. Um, a lot on the on the documents so we we done some work on the white paper and the product document which is like undergoing legal review right now as well as we're working on this video that's going to be explaining how proof of location work step by step basically so um we're thinking to release all of that in the coming weeks Uh, great. Um, and I guess last thing we can just give an update on Brandon about uh, the post you put out today as a result of the questionnaire. Um, if you want to just speak to that and then we can dive into the questions and hopefully have an open conversation. Yeah, so we recently had a questionnaire about setting up zone anchors and gathering interest about people that want to do that. And we put together a map showing all of those locations where people are interested to do that. And we, it was pretty insightful to see the global coverage that we have. And further going forward with that, we have, we're working on setting up local community groups. And there's one that started for Australia already, and a couple other people have reached out. So we're getting that going. We can provide resources for local meetups, uh, presentation materials, and food. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out to me on Telegram or email me at brandon at foam.space. Uh, yeah, so anyone interested in uh, hosting any sort of foam event in your community, uh, obviously we'll be sharing more information as we go forward in terms of uh, actual specifications. Uh, where we are right now, uh, we've designed these time synchronization protocols, uh, formally verified them, and have been designing these token economics, and we're kind of now where the protocol has been radio agnostic, we're working with hardware partners and distributed uh, Try to implement the proof of concept to see really what can be possible with the off-the-shelf hardware, uh, namely LoRa. And as soon as we can confirm that, we'll, we'll be open sourcing those specifications so people can start to help us uh, build these test networks uh, prior to launching. Um, but having said that, I'm going to just dive into some of the questions. We had uh, about 60 or so, but we tried to um, basically merge them down for ourselves so you can find them in the agenda. Uh, I'm going to try to just address them. Uh, in the next few minutes and hopefully there's just more questions and we can start to have a conversation all together. Um, 
So the first question that we had is about, can we speak to how zone anchor incentives work and why are they maintained to incentivize uh, the service? Uh, this is a great question. So right now we see these basically wireless sensor networks or beacons, they exist today. And currently there is no incentive to actually offer location services. Um, so we want to basically use these token incentives to basically be the incentive model. Uh, in that for our foam tokens, the primary way you can get more uh, is by running a zone. Um, and how would you know where you want to run a zone or where may the reward be higher? Uh, we have this aspect called signaling, where in the spatial index, uh, people can actually uh, use the token to lock it into a CSC at a location, uh, which would actually boost the rewards in that area when mining begins. And in the interim, can serve as a coordination tool for showing where people should start to test uh, these zones before the mining uh, actually begins. Uh, and once the protocol is fully launched, the incentive is that they're basically offering a service level agreement uh, for the secure time services. And if they fulfill this agreement, the zone's incentivized to basically charge customers fees, location customers. So they're incentivized to be uh, running accurately, uh, not being copied but they could then uh, basically have a revenue stream. And if they continue to provide that work, they're also eligible for new tokens uh, that they can mine. So that's kind of uh, for this first question of where the incentive model for zones come in. Um, uh, the next would be, do you need electricity and internet to run a zone anchor? Uh, the answer is yes, and especially in this first um, proof of concept, where the zone anchors will basically be gateways, like essentially uh, something that looks like a Linksys router in that it needs uh, basically a Linux computing board as well as internet connection to share state uh, about the zone. Uh, but eventually we would allow zone anchors to also be you know, small devices that exist on um, Raspberry Pis or even smaller aspects that don't have direct internet and can participate over radio and rely on one of these gateways as a relayer. So the full vision um, zone anchors don't necessarily have to have um, Internet, they definitely need electricity, but since it's a low power radio, um, a battery could help the device last for quite a long time. Um, the next question is about how is location initially seeded? Uh, how does a node know where it is? And this is something that has come up quite a bit in our telegram and um, happy to speak more to it. Uh, essentially, the time sync protocol works um, in geometric space, so it doesn't know anything about absolute time. So a zone can determine the geometry of itself. Uh, and it will work the same whether you set the zone up on the moon or on Earth. It doesn't know where it is relative to the North Pole, let's say. Um, but that said, if a zone registers in London, but in fact is in Alaska, no one would be able to get in touch with it. Uh, therefore, that zone can't uh, charge any customers. It can't make any money. Uh, and if another zone tries to get in touch with it in London and can't find it, well, then it'll be punished and slashed. Uh, and third, if you as a user are there and you can't localize yourself, well then that zone isn't where it says it is and it's eligible for a challenge. Uh, so we definitely see in terms of absolute positions of um, Earth that people would generate kind of these registries and you know, make sense themselves of absolute position. Uh, but the protocol itself, the zone, uh, will always just know its own relative position. Um, and that's kind of how we are addressing that. And it's not really an attack vector if the zone is somewhere else because one, it'll never be able to charge anyone and two, it would be found out and it would lose its bond eventually. Uh, so the location Howard, can I just chime in a little bit there? Um, you know, ultimately people, there's gonna be you know, named organizations running zone anchors who will be honest, right? So, so you, can, you can get away with a very small minority of honest nodes if, if they are continuously connected, right? This, this, once you have one trusted location, um, you can, if, as long as they're all connected, uh, you can derive all the other honest or dishonest locations from that. So it's, it's really a lot easier, I think, than people are making it out to be. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rick, for chiming in. Yeah, it's um, maybe confusing for people, but yeah, the absolute position aspect is, is not exactly uh, a problem that we see uh, there being. Um, and if you just have yeah one zone participant uh, being an institution, let's say a museum, you could always go there and inspect it and orient yourself uh, based on that, uh, as well as use other localization tools like GPS just to cross check uh, the signals. Um, the next question is thoughts on using Dash 7 uh, over LoRa. Uh, 
Interesting question. So just a differentiation, LoRa is actually just the physical chip, um, where Dash 7 is a Mac layer. And the most standard Mac layer is LoRa WAN, uh, which is what the Things Network uses, the open communities uh, that are like radios. Um, so we're speaking, actually, uh, have a meeting in person tomorrow, uh, funnily enough, with some of the authors of the Dash 7 Mac layer. Uh, we're currently exploring if that uh, may be a better alternative that allows more throughput um, than Laura Wong. So it's something we're exploring. Um, in terms of have we looked into regional laws uh, surrounding this kind of data rate and packet sizes, uh, these low power wider networks do operate in ISM bands. Uh, and there's quite loose restrictions based in US, uh, but it does vary by country. So it is more just what you can do on radio restrictive in countries in Europe or Australia. Um, so we have something that we've looked into. It's slightly out of our control and zones in those regions would have to accommodate um, to the jurisdictional laws. Uh, and that's why the time sync protocol is radio agnostic and that zones could be implemented in different fashions in a way that corresponds to the jurisdiction they're in uh, in the future. Um, a basic next question is just how can an augmented reality application um, utilize a store check-in for proof of location? Um, so the proof of location is a horizontal protocol that's really infrastructural and module, so anyone can then hook into it. So if you wanted to build an AR app uh, that involves check-ins, this app itself would basically dictate the logic of what the user needs to get from the phone protocol. And if this app is a very... Um, low security application, it's just about checking in to get a loyalty point. Maybe the app would say you need to show me one presence claim purchased from a zone. Uh, but the app can also define its own logic and maybe say the person checking in has to produce multiple presence claims or multiple ones throughout the day. Uh, so I'm just trying to stress that, you know, any application that wants to use this uh, infrastructure can kind of define their own logic on top of it uh, and really have client side verification dictating what uh, they require their users to present. Um, but it is a perfect example where you can design an augmented reality game that's blockchain based and require users to check in by generating foam presence claims and then presenting it uh, once it's generated it's a first class object on the blockchain that any other smart contract could reference or hook into uh, on this higher order app level. Um, in terms of what skill set is required to set up a zone anchor um, we will do our best to, you know, make the specifications uh, very simple to digest and understand and ideally um, quite off the shelf. I know the, a lot of the LoRa hobbyists and enthusiasts are not necessarily um, expert developers. It's more amateur based. So um, we don't imagine that you need to be uh, that insanely skilled. It could be potentially even simpler than setting up Ethereum miners, uh, but we will keep everyone posted. In terms of developing on the spatial index, um, maybe Christopher, you can speak about what kind of skills are required for that. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we've, uh, as some of you might know, who are developers, we're sort of in-house using somewhat unconventional tools, um, but we're uh, making great efforts to make that sort of um, independent of how someone an external developer would uh, use the spatial index and the API. So um, I would say that if a developer has um, traditional um, web app development skills, uh, they can certainly access our API. Uh, in fact, our API is um, automatically generated. So we have a REST API, right? And it's automatically generated uh, actually from our smart contracts. Uh, that's a simplification. But so as we uh, expand and um, add more functionality to our smart contracts, that also gets reflected uh, in the API. And we have a pretty high certainty that um, this sort of automatic um, update doesn't really prevent any new uh, troubles for developers. Like it all fits into the same system. Um, we've had some feedback on the difficulty of generating authentication uh, tokens. And this is, as we see it, really a consequence of the fact that um, we're using MetaMask and this somewhat obscure um, Web3 function for making signatures. Uh, so that's a little bit um, un um, unintuitive, but it's something that we're waiting for the 
Web3 developers to, and, and eventually MetaMask to integrate a more uh, intuitive flow there, which would allow us to actually display the data that we ask the MetaMask user to authenticate. An alternative that we're working on is to let you create an authentication token using uh, Uport. Uh, as of right now, it appears that their uh, implementation of that is slightly broken. So we're waiting basically on the Uport team to um, be able to integrate with them on that specific part. Um, other than that, I don't think there's been uh, any big question marks how to use the uh, API, but I'm happy to open up for questions maybe after we finish these. Sure. Um, There's just a few more uh, that we had on the agenda. So I can open up the questions from there. Um, somebody asked, can I use Foam to reward and incentivize the city citizens to crowdsource data about needed infrastructure, repairs, or problems? Uh, can I use Foam to geofence and exclude non-locals from the service? Uh, this is a really great question. So the first half about using Foam to incentivize people to crowdsource data, you can certainly use Foam for. And in the very near future on the main net of Ethereum, uh, we'll be using our spatial index and uh, offering basically modular tools for token curated registries about points of interest so that you can uh, basically incentivize people to try to crowdsource points of interest data. Uh, we see adding proof of location as a, basically a security upgrade. Uh, so that uh, in these kind of crowdsourcing applications, you can add as a parameter in the future uh, that the participants need to have a presence claim so that then you could in fact geofence and exclude non-locals uh, and, and basically exclude people who haven't been in that area from participating in the points of interest. So uh, that is exactly how we see phone being used, uh, especially to start and basically adding in geofence aspects as a security upgrade. Um, in terms of the question of if we're going to run a private subchain to work on scaling, um, we basically see every single zone as its own side chain blockchain. Um, and that's how we're addressing scaling in that the zone anchors will need to share a state and that state machine is uh, basically its own blockchain. Um, and that the location customers interacting with the zone are interacting over radio uh, or interacting with the subchain. And eventually there'll be latency of things going back to this parent uh, root chain like let's call it the public Ethereum chain, but uh, we're very aware of scaling uh, issues and actively working on them, solutions. Um, and somebody is requesting a demo of our parking DAO application. Um, I think maybe it's outside the scope of this moment of the call, but we can return to it uh, if there's time. Um, yeah, I could say that like, uh, we don't have a demo readily available for that, but that's something that we're actively working on to put on the developer portal. So maybe expect a uh, more detailed walkthrough or maybe even video in a week or two. Um, cool, so that, that was all the kind of questions we had on the agenda that people submitted, but um, I'd like to open up now to any outstanding questions or comments people have on the call. Can I go now? Sure. Um, so first, just wanna thank all of you, uh, Ryan and Christopher and the entire Foam team. This is, uh, I've been in the crypto blockchain world since early 20, 2011, and this is one of my favorite projects so far. I'm wondering, uh, so my background's in physics, graduate studies in physics. I'm wondering if any of you have considered decentralized speed of light uh, transactions slash location uh, confirmation validation via a receipt and rebroadcast of wireless uh, signals. Um, I'm not 100 sure. Sure, I understand the question. If the question is, do we bound sort of the reply times for a given location with the speed of light? Then yes, uh, and indeed a, a presence claim depends on this. Um, two-way communication between a consumer of the um, zone anchors radio signal and the response thereof, um, which, as you know, effectively creates a bound on to the, the the potential distance that it could be from there. Um, but I'm not sure exact if that's exactly what you were asking. Um, well, that's interesting uh, what you said, but it's probably not quite what I'm getting at. Um, so 
so I, I, I love the um, sort of block, you know, decentralized blockchain validation of location. Uh, I guess what I'm getting at is you can do validation of location. You can do speed of light comp as far as my understanding um, in, in sort of uh, the work I've done on speed of light confirmation. So speed, decentralized speed of light transaction or and or location transaction or location validation via receipt and rebroadcast of wireless signals yeah so that's basically how the protocol works like at a at a in a very hand wavy sort of way i mean we're relying on those physical properties to determine uh the relative location of objects in space right and so can you do that to actually then and then that time stamping service i i don't know how much of uh how much of this stuff has been made how much has been publicly announced um but but the time stamping service, you would then rely on that. So basically, like if you're a user and you imagine you're doing some sort of other computation where you want to know that the, the, the total ordering of transactions in time, you could rely on the timestamp generated from the zone anchors to provide a total global ordering of transactions uh, in some other blockchain or some other environment, which I, I think is sort of where you're trying to get to is how do you have a more general blockchain solution that relies on this uh, speed of light uh, timing? Who's speaking right now? It's Rick Dudley speaking. I'm just trying to find the, the page where your video is. Uh, I don't have video. Okay, that explains that. Um, uh, any other comments from the team on on that? Uh, again, I, I have to repeat, like, I don't really understand the specifics of the question. So I tried to explain that we do utilize, I mean, those are parameters in our system and our system follows the laws of physics. So we do use that for creating upper bounds. Um, now, so I don't I'm just going to try. Uh, one more time for a little clarification. Um, transactions, basically an announcement of a transaction or a validation of location um, can be confirmed locally via receipt and rebroadcast of wireless messages. Um, and there's, a way you can incentivize those validations to be propagate, propagated. And in, in other words, whoever can broadcast wirelessly at a further distance, there can be evidence of who, who is reached non-redundant notification. So there could be incentive for not, you can, you can earn a, and uh, for example, you could earn, it's sort of like mining for um, message, fastest possible message propagation worldwide or you know, beyond in the long term. Um, so anyway, I, anyway that, was, that was my last effort to try to clarify what I'm getting at. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to digest that maybe offline and see if I come up with something. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I guess, should I, do I, I'll, uh, let's do a private message, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, cool, yeah, love to learn more. Um, anyone else have any questions? Hi. Comments? Hi, guys. Uh, I have a quick question um, on the accuracy. I, I think I asked the question on, on the Telegram chat once, but uh, are there any plans to increase the accuracy uh, one of the products uh, my team is working on is the uh, road space negotiation protocol and we were kind of researching that ourselves utilizing GPS um, you know just simple reading from the phone but there are obstacles like you know GPS proofing and all that so uh, that's how I found your project uh, in December so 
uh, are you planning to for for use cases like that to increase accuracy or is it dependent on your radio or chip you're using or um, any plans or in that area yeah so the time synchronization protocol can um, synchronize the clocks in the node up to one clock tick uh, so then the precision accuracy is kind of dependent on how accurate your clocks are um, do you have um, na nanosecond clock precision or um, millisecond clock precision. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of factors in terms of um, just like multi-path and line of sight of uh, this technology. So uh, right now we're not trying to compete uh, with accuracy. Uh, we would like to get something like equivalent to GPS of like four to 10 meters. Um, and some aspect with this low power wide area radio technology is it's quite new and there's a lot of unknown, unknown unknowns. So for example, the most nodes I've seen in a localization study for LoRa was about 40 nodes and they got sub four meter accuracy, but I haven't even seen anyone try, you know, 100 nodes or 500 nodes. So uh, that's part of the reason why uh, we need um, this to be a grassroots kind of effort of people helping to coordinate testing these uh, technologies and seeing what levels of precision and accuracy we can get and what optimal node counts might be. Um, so we're definitely interested in, you know, making this as precise and robust uh, as possible. Uh, with, you know, the trade-offs of the hardware that would also be as easily accessible. Um, and from there, uh, specific use cases that need even like, you know, more precision, the, the zone and the technology is radio agnostic, so you could deploy your own proof of authority zone with a different kind of radio that, you know, is for a specific indoor use case, let's say, that got you even better accuracy. Um, so there's definitely room over time to uh, find ways to have accuracy be the primary concern. Perfect answer. Thanks so much. I, I have a question. Um, really looking forward to the white paper release and, and checking the, that out in detail. But um, yeah, I'm curious if, if you can maybe explain briefly um, how a location claim would be generated for, say, like a device that does not have a radio transmitter or receiver. Is that, is that something that's possible? Uh, no, so it does rely on, you know, being able to receive the signals of a zone uh, and communicate back with it. Uh, the reason we're interested in this, starting with the low power wide area network radios, is because there are many different ones all competing to be a uh, consumer standard. So you can imagine they would be in consumer phones someday soon. Uh, specifically with LoRa, people have developed like dongles for iPhones and like Bluetooth adapters. Um, but they, one of these devices would be uh, definitely the standard for IoT, which or you know, autonomous cars or drones, which definitely would be one of the major location customers. Uh, so we would imagine maybe the first location customers who are blockchain users wouldn't mind having some sort of extra adapter. Um, but eventually, like I said, the zones can be radio agnostic. Uh, they could also potentially receive messages in different kinds of radio. So let's say the first zone anchors running the time sync protocol over LoRa also accept Bluetooth messages. So if you happen to be you know, within 30 feet of it, you could still pass a message to it. There's nothing really to verify, but at least you could do it from your phone yeah. to start. It might be interesting to think about like proxies, devices that uh, have like multi-band capacities, but also are able to, you know, at least cryptographically verify or vouch for the, the, the proxying that it performs. Um, it's some, not something we're ruling out, but, but also not actively looking into right now. Yeah, I, I think you can do it transitively, right? If, if you don't have uh, the, the, you're going to, the quality of your claim will be lower because obviously you won't have the round trip time, but you will be able to say like, these two devices are paired based on some mutual cryptographic signing and then this, so, you know, these claims are transitive or something, right? I think okay. that'll be the easiest way to do it. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. I guess so. The, a way to think about it is there there are kind of like two classes of devices maybe that that participate in the protocol, like static, like devices that that don't move, and those that that can. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, that's great. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Ryan, can I ask a question? Um, sure. Uh, did you receive the messages I sent? I sent some messages to you. I'm not, I don't remember exactly who was talking with me on the, the issue, the, the technical matters I brought up. Um, I believe it was me, Christopher and Rick. Uh, I haven't checked my messages cause I'm on the call. So. Okay. So I don't know if you'll, I, I'm not sure if when the call terminates, you'll, you'll have a record of those, right? Uh, yeah. 
I don't know how else to share my, my contact information. So if you can just, just want to make sure that came through. Yeah, I see your uh, email here. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, if, I, if I may, I have a question as well. Sure. Um, <clears throat> are you listening? Are you, can you hear me or? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So my name is Tiberius from uh, Sensorica and I'm uh, waiting for um, your white paper also to look at. And my interest now, uh, as we're uh, kind of looking at your, uh, your um, infrastructure that we're putting in place, um, we have a use case for it for physical resource management <laughs> um, in decentralized networks. Um, and um, we're very careful when we engage uh, with this kind of new technologies about the the governance uh, behind it. Uh, so my question is, <clears throat> how do you um, how do you envision the governance of uh, the ecosystem around foam, um, and how do you see yourselves as you know uh, developers and pioneers uh, with this technology within that ecosystem uh, in the short term and in in, in the long term? Um, are there um, levers of control and power over the long term, or you're trying to um, open it up and, and create just an open ecosystem around this technology and platform? So, uh, great question. Uh, definitely the latter, um, but there's going to have to be different stages of decentralization. Like, for example, just the spatial index web app, the most efficient way to host it is still using uh, Amazon uh, Web Services. Uh, so even though we have, you know, decentralized, you can, in, if it's on the mainnet, you can interact with it um, on a decentralized blockchain. There's still this kind of compromise of how fully decentralized these things are. Uh, and the same will hold for um, the foam protocol. So while it's going to be open source uh, and it won't be rent seeking and anyone can become their own service provider uh, and basically um, offer location services and charge fees, uh, there's still this aspect of um, how decentralized and open is it? Um, so definitely in the first phase on the mainnet, uh, the mining have, will not have started. So um, in the, that sense, the team will be in control of a multi-sig over the remaining uh, token amount. Uh, and that'll really require the people who are um, building these token created registries, building these applications on the spatial index, but also signaling where they want uh, zones to appear and helping us build it. So very much be a grassroots kind of movement. Uh, we, though, would have at uh, that moment the control of when we say it's ready to start the mining. Uh, but then from there, it's kind of um, open. And of course, us as the team can still work on the actual protocol and propose upgrades or, or changes. But, um, you know, the zone operators are uh, can opt in or, you know, use the technology and fork it in their own manner if they wish, uh, being that it would be open sourced. Yeah, that helps a lot. Uh, do you think about uh, creating a, some sort of um, non-for-profit organization that would be the custodian of, of uh, the, the platform or yeah, the technology behind the code? Or Part of the plan. Um, we are currently a U.S. company and uh, will be so for the short term, but plan to open a foundation that would uh, basically be the steward of the community and help organize, you know, things like conferences or hackathons. Probably the most analogous will be the uh, Zero Coin Corporation and the Zcash Foundation. Um, so it's definitely on the agenda. I would also just as a comment, so obviously like in the long term, it's hard to make predictions, but uh, it's in, we are already making our best. Uh, we are really attempting to reach out to more seasoned organizations that have already dealt with uh, localization, uh, you know, and with um, applications that are global. We obviously don't have, you know, um, a wide, such a wide perspective all coming from uh, basically the same place. Um, so I guess our strategy there is really to, to, to try to innovate technologies that we hope to just to be able to inject or that other organizations can absorb from us. And we don't really have any interest in, uh, in, from, from in terms of IP or anything else to, to prevent them from doing that. Um, the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, we're already in, in, in bi-weekly conversations with them, and I would expect that something would come out of that relatively soon. Um, that is an example of, of, of how we're already starting to initiate these conversations. In addition, I would say that um, we, our aim is to basically um, produce only open source uh, artifacts. Um, we've already released a number of sort of software libraries uh, due to sort of the bootstrapping phase of, of our company, we haven't released everything as open source. 
uh, but eventually, and that's that's what we're aiming for as well. So there's always that uh, part, right? Like that someone could just fork this both on the blockchain, but also in, just as in, from the, the technology that, that we're developing as well. So that, that should give you some sort of uh, confidence in uh, working with us, I hope. Yeah, thank you very much. That, that is uh, very helpful. We, we're trying to work with organizations that, um, you know, at some point don't turn around and lock us into something that becomes more proprietary um, and we want to have an impact and, and put our own, you know, needs into the mix and, and try to influence the, um, the, the evolution of, of your tech uh, in a way that is also favorable for, for us and for our own ecosystem. So having access to, to the future of the technology, I think is very important for us. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and as a, maybe last comment on that, um, so for example, Richard Stallman wrote an, an op-ed in uh, The Guardian the other day about how, uh, about uh, companies tracking data and specifically location, uh, you know, without consent. And I think maybe, uh, one of the more interesting um, potential conflicts would be, are we a GPL project or, you know, a more permissive license? Uh, I don't think we've fully determined the path we're taking there, but I'm bringing that up because actually being GPL and fully uh, open is actually a uh, roadblock for a lot of bigger companies to work with, uh, with you. So that's an, that's an interesting conversation to have, uh, in my opinion. Um, do you, what's your uh, state or, or city in the U.S.? Uh, we're working out of New York City, uh, Brooklyn, actually. Great. I was curious um, of your thoughts on the notion of private proof of location. Is that, yeah. something, is that so, something you guys uh, are thinking about for the future or? I, th I think the way we're imagining is you can deploy a zone uh, as a private or permissioned zone. Um, and if you don't trust all the actors, you're still able to utilize the global protocol as like a dispute mechanism. Um, so if you wanted to set up like a private proof of location zone and you're in control of all the uh, zone anchors and you don't allow any other people to join, you could do that, uh, but still like uh, be going through the verification process and publishing to the public chain. Also, um, in terms of how the claims are generated, uh, the, there's a lot of flexibility um, for the mobile beacon to engage in key rotation. So you, you have a lot of uh, opportunity to preserve your privacy as the mobile beacon. Uh, zone anchors obviously have a limited ability to preserve their privacy. And of course, um, that privacy preservation is going to be susceptible to any kind of traditional link analysis. Yeah, very well put. Great, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, is there, may I ask, uh, or can I engage, uh, so we're on a, on a business level in terms of, uh, would that, would you prefer to do that privately or? What's the question? Basically, you know, have, have you taken investment? Are you open to investment? Do you have an incorporated entity? Things like that. Uh, yeah, we're planning a token sale, hopefully uh, within the next six weeks. So uh, please stay tuned for more details. Okay. Wait, I need to map. Are you guys planning a pre-sale or it's going to be a, a direct ICO right away? Uh, yeah, we're um, working uh, under this new token framework uh, as part of the Brooklyn Project Initiative, something started by uh, Consensus. So we're hoping to have the sale on this uh, new platform called Token Foundry, where uh, we'll be selling this consumer product uh, with no pre-sale uh, discounts or bonuses. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have any uh, questions or comments? I have a question. Uh, do, uh, are there any uh, uh, developers in the audience? Um, just like to gauge sort of the interest, like how many uh, have a location developer or like would like to develop on this themselves? 
Are there anyone? I don't know if I can do a hands up here, but. Yes. Uh, yeah, I plan on using this. Okay, cool. A couple of ones. Yes. Uh, I, I believe that we might need a little bit more uh, education regarding what's available to us for um, accountabilities and how it's being used and perhaps the process and timeline for what's to be expected. Uh, I'm sure in the end we want to have like some form of organized system where we all are on the same level. It seems like, because um, I'm fairly new so I, I'm not too familiar with it, but is there like a structure that we follow or any type of accountability or expectations or any system like that in place? Yeah, I don't really, uh, oh, are you talking as a developer? Uh, or? or as a zone anchor. Oh. And, and as a zone anchor, yeah, just like on a practical level, like what's, uh, what are we expected, what's our accountability and what's the process so that we're up to speed to make sure that what we're doing and saying is not completely misrepresenting the, the project. Yeah, so um, when it's actually up and running and uh, you're able to mine uh, new tokens by running a zone, um, you, your accountability will be by the safety deposit required. So you primarily need the phone token to use as collateral um, in a bonded deposit. And that's basically you saying, I'm going to operate the protocol as the rule set is defined in these contracts. I'm not going to be malicious. I'm not going to be faulty. And I promise to do so because I'm locking up a uh, this large amount of valuable tokens uh, in order, order to provide that work. Um, and part of the why we need everyone to kind of help build this protocol together in a permissionless fashion and test it is so we can figure out all these unknown unknowns and actually um, finalize what the kind of punishments would be. Um, so generally, uh, the zone anchors will be held accountable uh, and will have to fulfill their service level agreements, but the exact details of that uh, haven't been finalized. Um, and in the pre-stage where, you know, the zone anchors are not mining yet, you as a participant or developer, um, I mean, you're able to build whatever you'd like or contribute in any way you see fit. So there's no exact um, accountability yet uh, only once you're bonding tokens and providing work that way. As a, as a developer, if I had uh, an interest or I had something that I think would benefit um, by using this as a resource, but I didn't have the skill set required, would I be able to utilize... Uh, Anyone who does have the skill set, would I be able to discuss that with them so that we can work together, or is it completely like autonomous for each individual? Um, you definitely could find people who are developers, and um, you know, if you have an idea for a spatial application, can begin to sketch it out and test it using our API for the spatial index. Uh, we'll continue to add kind of tutorials um, and ideas for skins, so and eventually open up a more formal way to engage with Foam uh, for application ideas. So. Um, you can look out for that. Yeah, I mean, you're bringing up a good point. I think um, uh, maybe eventually, so what we're, what we're aiming to do is to make the developer portal as comprehensive as possible. So that's just sort of like bootstrap the, uh, the onboarding process. Um, also want to mention that the whole developer portal is hosted on GitHub. So if there are anything from like a spelling error to a new tutorial or to a link to an application that uh, anyone would want to add, we're very open to that. And you can, in fact, just make a pull request into the developer portal. And we, if, if it, you know, satisfies some quality criteria, we would certainly accept it in that attribute. Uh, um, just uh, another question regarding the legal aspect of it. Like, is there anything in place to, like, uh, protect any type of copyright infringement? Like, if someone were to begin or had something that they started and they were to get some form of support, is there anything in place to kind of uh, give authority to the one who began developing that application? I mean, that's, if, uh, if I understand your question correctly, that's just a question of how you would license your contribution. So, yes, basically, yeah. And so that's you know, not something that we're in control of. You obviously be the copyright holdover, but um, my assumption is that we can only really add it to the, you know, the, the public domain, so to speak, if it follows a permissive license. Uh, I would say if you do have, um, concerns about something being an original invention and you don't feel immediately confident in revealing it, you should probably just reach out to us first. Uh, not that we're legal experts, but it might just be the best path. Okay, thank you. I was just uh, just curious about that. But yeah, I mean, on, the, on, a, on a 
bigger note, like we are not uh, intending to incorporate any technology that's like encumbered by patents or, or you know, anything that would uh, prevent us from spreading our technology to, any, to everyone. Um, maybe can you guys talk just a little bit about the beacons or are you planning to uh, make your own beacons um, to sell or um, planning to kind of leverage the community for that or? Uh, we're planning to leverage the community and uh, ideally what's available to purchase today. Um, so like these LoRa gateways are a prime candidate. Um, whether or not those meet the final specifications, we would just be open sourcing the specs and uh, be um, a hardware company in the same way Ethereum is in the sense that uh, that's actually a software company, but the software is backed by people running hardware. Uh, and if this is um, attractive enough kind of protocol, there would be incentive for people to make even more off the shelf uh, beacons uh, potentially that we partnered with, but uh, we primarily are not planning to sell uh, the beacons. I mean, but I would add that we are in uh, conversations with hardware companies for at least developing initial prototypes and there might also be opportunities uh, with them for to actually sell devices. Uh, we're not we're not doing this in the dark, so to speak. Okay, thanks. Uh, everybody, I, I'm signing off. But if I if anybody if any of the foam team wants to engage in terms of what I was talking about, decentralized uh, speed of light, incentivized speed of light transaction confirmations, location confirmations, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. Okay, thanks. thanks. Bye. Um, so I think we're getting pretty close to the end of the hour. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining. If there's any kind of like last uh, questions anyone wants to throw out. There are a few questions in the chat. Uh, Um, so to Max, uh, our beta is uh, the full stack web app for the spatial index visualizer. So you can build uh, applications. Uh, it's a software beta, so uh, we're not uh, beta testing the hardware at the moment. So the beacons you see in the index are just the simulation. Uh, they're not, not representative of any real hardware in the world. Um, maybe tokens can be used for discounts on hardware. Uh, sure. that's. So definitely an interesting uh, idea to keep in mind as we further develop this uh, technology. Um, we have looked into partnering with logistics and tracking. Uh, we are uh, part of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance and have joined the supply chain working group. So we're looking to make headway there. And I know in all these enterprise proof of concepts, um, they're not really addressing location as a parameter. So um, foam fits in nicely there. Um, to your question, Will, about how to potentially find others that are interested in becoming part of the FOAM network, uh, you can look to the questionnaire results that we just published on our Medium blog. Uh, that was Brandon's post, uh, where you can see where people uh, posted on a heat map where they're interested. And if they're in your vicinity, uh, we could try to, I don't know, facilitate uh, reaching out uh, to them that way. Um, that's all the questions I really see in the chat. Um, if anyone has any final remarks, otherwise, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, also, thank you to you, Brandon, for help organizing. Yeah, and thanks everyone for your questions. Um, I, I can just add, I see that, um, yeah, um, I kind of just like small update that um, the reason that we were like not releasing white paper and the product document right now, because we working, um, uh, we working with the legal team um, and it's taking so much time because we want uh, we want to offer tokens to us um, and to be able to offer to to everyone and not exclude any geographies so we almost at the end of this process so we're going to be releasing um, a lot of documents a lot of materials in the like a few coming weeks so stay tuned and there will be more we will be uh, be more documents on the timelines and um, next steps and the token event. Great. That's, that's all. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we'll definitely have another call in the near future. Uh, in the meantime, please continue to uh, send any questions our way via our Telegram.
Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for your interest and we'll be eager to share more information uh, in the coming weeks. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you guys. You all. Thanks. Bye.